Welcome to this interview between myself, Jason Finucan, and Matthew Dixon. First off, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm the founder of a company called Stigma Zero. We recognize that declining mental health and the stigma of mental illness pose an expensive problem that hurts employees and undermines company culture. Stigma Zero's innovative training programs, which are online, virtual, and live, provide employees, managers, HR personnel, and leadership with the skills, knowledge, and tools needed to better respond to these complex workplace challenges. And now I'd like to introduce you to my guest, Matthew Dixon. Matthew Dixon helps people with mental illness in developing countries so they can get access to basic mental health care through his MindAid platform. MindAid acts as a hub that steers people towards organizations working for the cause. These organizations use models of basic mental health care that are low cost, proven effective, and scalable. Some of these organizations have been endorsed by Bill Clinton, Forrest Whitaker, Arcade Fire, Ashley Judd, as well as Robin Williams' son, Zach Williams, and Tim Shriver, founder of the Special Olympics. Matthew has successfully recovered from schizophrenia and has bicycled across Canada, which having driven across Canada myself, I can say that is one serious feat to bicycle <laughs> across our massive country. Uh, Matthew, it's a pleasure to, to speak with you today. And um, I think to start, the best thing to do really is for you to tell me and our listeners a bit more about your story and this very important advocacy work that you do. Sure, thanks, Jason. Thanks for having me on your uh, uh, podcast here. So I'm, I'm Canadian, I'm 49. I got schizophrenia when I was 22 and it's, it's tough. When I tell people about the disease, I wanna, I have two audiences. One is I wanna make people who aren't aware of how bad mental illness is, how bad it actually is. But I also wanna give people hope. I don't want people to say, well, it's too tough. I can't go through that. That's the exact opposite message I want to give people. It's it, you can get through it. It's it's it seems impossible, but you can get through it. And so I I like I, I bicycled across Canada when I was twenty. I wasn't feeling the best throughout university and even when I did the trip. But and I and I wanted to do more fun stuff like that. But my disease was slowly coming on and. Then when it hit, it hit hard and it took me 27 years to get better. So uh, what I do now is my main focus is uh, helping people with mental illness in developing countries. And my website, mindaid.ca, I've got, uh, I'm on social media. My YouTube channel has over 200 videos that I've archived from other people on YouTube around the cause. So there's hours and hours of information there if people want to learn more. And I've also started a Facebook group, which is uh, for people to meet each other and, and brainstorm ways on how we can help help people. The, the MindAid platform that steers people towards six nonprofits that I found that are helping people get basic mental health care in developing countries. And if I could build their capacity and get more people donate, donating to them, fundraising for them, and plus, I know there are people out there who have leadership, business skills, who would want to start their own nonprofit or social business to help. So, yeah, that's uh, that's that's my main focus. That I, I'm I find that incredibly inspiring. Um, we're we're very similar in the sense that we both have experienced mental illness firsthand, and our reaction to that once we were able to recover was to try to give back to society and do something with this knowledge that we had gained uh, along the way. But to really understand that um, from your perspective, I think we need to know what is it like living with schizophrenia, both when it came on, when it was at its worst, but also now. Yeah, so with me, I know with schizophrenia, a lot of people and you know other mental illness too, there's often a revolving door of uh, getting some treatment, feeling better, going off your meds, then getting sick again, then going back and uh, getting treatment again. I was not like that. I, well, for one thing with schizophrenia, 75% of people who have the disease have hallucinations, auditory and or visual. I never did. I was in the, in the 25% that didn't. I also never had any problems with substance abuse, which can sometimes go hand in hand with mental illness. So I was grateful for both of them. 
the sorry, disease. that was on my side. <laughs> What's that? I said that that notification was on my side. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> the the disease uh, to, uh, disorganized thinking is one of the symptoms. It's uh, your your thinking is really. It just feels like it's your thoughts are going a mile a minute. It's it's disorganized, but at the same time, and other people with schizophrenia have said this. I've read that even though it's hard to think properly, there's still another part of your brain that ticks along just fine. I mean, in my early years, at my worst, I was living in a in a psych ward for a part of a year. Then I was in a group home for three years, and but I still had to make decisions like, do I want to go back and finish my degree? I had to fail out of my uh, six courses that I was taking for my civil engineering degree and I made a decision yes I'll go and take one course this term and then the next term I took another course it took me three years and I, I did finally get my degree but I had to make decisions like that it's it's there's a, you know do I want to go for a run right now do I want to have pizza now do I want to have you know this parts of your brain are just are working fine so then other lot your logical part of your brain is working fine but it, you're just bombarded by stimuli. So your my vision was affected. It's uh, it felt like I was seeing things in two dimensions, not three. A lot of mm. people say it's like watching TV where you can't or watching Zoom. Yeah, <laughs> you, yeah. you can't reach in and and in, interact with the people on the screen. You feel very cut off. Even if the person's right in front of you. Oh yeah, oh yeah. yeah. It, that, that's the way it was for my entire uh, 27 years of recovery. It's uh, to, and. The, my recovery, I went, so I, I got on a medication and I stayed on it. I, 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 I didn't go out and off, go off and on my medication. So I stayed in it and basically I noticed an improvement in my health every single week for 27 years. And if you plotted, plotted it on a graph, it'd just be a long, slow, steady lineup of recovery week by week by week over mm -hmm. 27 years. And it was actually this year, February 11th, 2021 that my symptoms just finally left for good. I, uh, I want to comment on this for a second because again it, it, it really does um, I really connect with what you're saying not the 27 year gap I can't I can't even imagine the amount of patience and perseverance required to continue the hope you you had that it, you know yes there was a pattern it was getting better but it was very slow. And so it must have been so, so challenging for you. But, but this idea that there was a day that you remember the date, um, for me, it's June 5th, 2005. And that was when the medication that I was taking for bipolar disorder finally reached a therapeutic level. And for me, that was my uh, on off switch where prior to that date, I was ill with my illness. I was struggling with it. I was, um, my hope was more theoretical than 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 uh, rooted in any kind of fact, and then after that date was when I realized no, there was hope because the treatment was working, and what I had to do just like you, I had to stay on the treatment and and be diligent about that, and uh, and also like you, this I think really separates us from a lot of people that struggle mightily with mental illness is that we didn't have substance abuse problems. Um, that that is such a common thread through mental illness. And the reason I would argue is this fear of acknowledging the illness, this, this stigma that is out there in society and in our workplaces um, can really shut us down. And I believe alcohol and drugs can often become just a coping mechanism, but that can obviously lead to, to many worse things. Um, it is amazing and I applaud your, your perseverance um, to, to get to that date in February and Having spoken with you uh, prior to this interview, I can I can feel it from you how how uh, happy and satisfied you are that that you're finally living as well as you are and essentially symptom free, which is just amazing. Um, let's let's talk about what took you from somebody who was trying to work their way through their own illness to someone who not only chose to help society but specifically um, to help. Uh, in developing countries. I'm fascinated by that. What, what brought you to that decision? So in my early years, I, I, I talked to another uh, guy I know with schizophrenia and he said, you just can't do anything at, at its worst. It's, it's so disabling. But week by week, year by year, I, I was able to, I, I kept pushing myself to take on, talk a little bit more each week and each month, you know, I, and so 
as years went on, and, and I mean, this is 1994 when I first got, got diagnosed. So there's, the internet was just getting started. And so I didn't have, there's no YouTube, Facebook, social media. There's, people didn't have platforms. And so I, 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 I when I, I don't know around what year, but probably maybe 2005 or so, I started to, I gave my, I fostered a child in Ethiopia with a plan oh, Canada here. Wow. And so I did that for six, seven years or so. And I, I was doing those things because I was reading books. I, uh, the year 2000, I started reading books on how to get myself better. Mental health tips, physical health tips, people skills. And in a lot of the books, they say, you know, if you want to get better mental health, help other people. So mm. that's what I was starting to do just in, you know, donating to charities just in my local area, the, the foster child I had in Ethiopia. So those were in my mind. And I will say that even though I was doing those things and lots of people say, well, I, I donate to help other people because it makes me feel so good. And I felt cheated out of that because my brain wouldn't let me feel the pleasure from feeling good. So, but I, I kept doing them and because, and it's neat now because years back, when I look back on it, uh, years in the future now, I, I can see, you know what, there's a part, even though you can't feel good from doing those things, like I, I couldn't, I, I couldn't feel the pleasure of helping somebody in whatever capacity, there's still something that registers with you. There's still something that, that it registers in you, like I'm doing something. And years later, you can say, you know what, I did that. Yeah. I, I did those things. And it, it may feel like just nothing. It's just a blah, blah, blah day. You're just going through another day with mental illness. But doing those things, even like uh, I, I went, uh, uh, took a plane ride out to Vancouver. And, you know, that was, that was a big deal for me many years ago to, to mm -hmm. do that. But I could say I did that. It's, it's, I didn't have the best time out there because I wasn't feeling good. I just, I, I wasn't totally 100%. And, but you could still do those things. So it was, while I was going through mental illness, my heart went out to people who had, who lived in, in poverty, uh, war-torn countries. I'm like, how, in the, how do you do that? It, it's, I mean, I was going through mental illness in Canada with one of the better mental health care systems, although we need a lot of work here, just like all the other developed countries. Mm -hmm. And, but it's, my heart just went out to them. And I, I stumbled upon this TED talk in 2017 by Vikram Patel. And he's mm -hmm. one of the global leaders for mental health in developing countries. And it was the first piece of information I'd ever found on the web about this cause. So I started researching it more and I found a lot of, a, a fair bit, a lot of information on it. And with my website, I've tried to uh, summer, uh, give an overview of the things going on. A, a lot of the information is scattered across the web. I'm, I'm trying to uh, make my website a bit of a hub. I don't go into great depth in any one thing, but I try to point people in a bunch of different directions. Like, look, here's someone, this group's working on this, this group's working on this. So yeah, that's, that's kind of how I uh, got into that. That's, that's fantastic. And, and I think it is, um, it is a very important point to say that while in developing countries like Canada, US and Britain and, and all over the world, any developing country has really still a very far way to go before we can say we have a good structure to support mental illness and to treat mental health challenges and to educate. Um, of course, you're absolutely right. You and I are incredibly blessed to have faced our challenges in this country rather than in a developing country. So I, I think uh, that shows a lot of heart and empathy on you on your part. And uh, I, it, there's no doubt that it is needed uh, badly. Now, let me ask you this question, because while I am um, a stigma fighter, as my shirt says, and while I am uh, an expert on, on mental health and mental illness, I really fully acknowledge that that really, that knowledge and that expertise ends in the developing world. I don't have expertise on the mental health uh, uh, or the mental illness statistics in, uh, the develop in developing countries uh, versus the developed world. Um, so what is the state of mental health care in developing countries? I'm, I'm, I'm assuming it's not very good, but tell me what you know. Yeah, so the, the stats are, I've actually, I'm a little proud of this. I made up one stat myself. I mean, I didn't make it up, but the World Health Organization throws out stats of so many hundreds of, million of millions of people in the world who have mental illness. 
and then a percentage of those who have uh, who in, who are in developing countries. Okay. So I, I've I just calculated it out and I've tried to make that stat. Uh, I, I throw that out a lot. It works out to over 270 million people in developing countries with no mental health care, and that's so. For example, with clean water, there are around 700 million people with no clean water in the world. So 270 million is up there with the leading causes for sure. And the, even the mental health experts say 270 million sounds low. It's, it's yeah. hard to get numbers. The other thing, another, there's three stats I like to, to throw out to people. And that's, that's the one I just said. The mm -hmm. other one is uh, some countries have only one psychiatrist per million people. So some one countries psychiatrist per million people. Per million people, yeah. Wow. It's, yeah, like you, you'll go, there's actually a chart, the World Health Organization has a chart where it shows all the countries and what they, the number of psychiatrists they have per 100,000 people. And I mean, some are less than one. Uh, I mean, you'll go on a country with like, that has 40 million people and they've got like three psychiatrists for the whole country. Oh yeah, and that's just impossible. That's so many people who, who cannot access the, the very specific uh, expertise and guidance they need. Yeah. The other stat I share, and it's the most shocking, is some people are actually kept in chains with mental illness. They're tied to a tree, tied to a bed. Some of them have their feet through a log. And the stats on those are, they estimate, and it's really hard to get stats on those because those people are hidden a lot of the time in sheds and whatnot. They estimate hundreds of thousands in 60 countries. So it, they, they don't use the word million or millions. It's, it's estimated less than a million of those 270 million or more. So it's uh, not every, but not, so most people don't, aren't kept in chains, but there are staggering numbers that are, so. Yeah, and that's, I mean, that harkens back to, um, uh, in one of our training programs, we actually do a history of mental illness and, and we go all the way back to the, uh, the 17 and 1800s and the kind of treatment in the countries we now consider developed um, what was being done. And some of it included similar things like, like institutionalizing people and, and ostracizing them, doing tests on them and, and awful, awful things. So the reason a lot of this happens is always rooted in a lack of knowledge about what mental illness is and a lack of resources often, um, not knowing what to do with these people because their behavior just is different and, and they don't quite know how to handle it. And I think that's why organizations like yours and, 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 and uh, hubs like MindAid can be so vital to helping just get that information out there so that people have a clearer idea of what they can do. And that leads to my next question. What exactly can people do here in Canada for, or in the US or whoever's listening to this? Um, what can people do to help people with mental illness in developing countries? I've got two things. One is raising awareness, just having conversations about this. And the other is uh, the six nonprofits that I steer people towards that I found giving basic mental health care. I, I want to build their capacity and, uh, and have people donating and fundraising to them. For the awareness, uh, when I, I mean, it's easy to, I mean, it's a lot of the stuff can be done for free sharing posts, having conversations with people. Mm -hmm. And when I, when I talk to somebody, I mean, mental health in, in 2021, everyone's talking about mental health now. It's so easy, I mean, to talk, to bring up in a conversation. 10, 20 years ago, it was harder to bring mental health up in a conversation, but now it's just uh, free for all, it seems. <laughs> yeah. So, which is amazing. It's, uh, yeah. so when I, when I- Come a long way, for sure. Oh yeah. And when I, when I talk to somebody and I try to work into the conversation mental health in developing countries, I throw out one or two or three of those stats that I just said, like the one, some countries have one psychiatrist, psychiatrist per million people, or some people are kept in chains and that really raises eyebrows. Mm -hmm. And it's just a matter of seconds. Like I, I'm feeling like 20 seconds or so and people get the idea of it. They get the gist, the seed's been put in their mind and they, it's not a hard stretch to, you know, if we're building schools for them, if we're drilling wells and doing all these other things, buying goats, microcredit, it doesn't, it, it doesn't uh, take much, much more time to think, oh yeah, well, yeah, what if they do, do have bipolar or schizophrenia or anything else? What do they do? A yeah. lot of people haven't thought of that because it hasn't been spelled out for them. So I'm, I'm, I kind of feel like Johnny Appleseed a bit, just throwing out all these like uh, seeds for people, like just yeah. to start thinking about this. 
And if people, if people want uh, to, to, if there's want to send people to mindy.ca, I've tried, as far as I know, there's not another website out there that has that sort of uh, overview of all the things going on. And I, and I don't have an overview of everything going on. I, I, when I find something new, I try to add it to the, to the, to my site. The, uh, there's a group, uh, it's uh, Generation Mental Health and the, the links on the top, near the top of my website. And they're helping get the next leaders, the next generation of the leaders. They're, they're training youth how to be global mental health leaders. That's the term global mental health. It's, uh, yeah. I, I often say mental health in developing countries, but the term global mental health means health in every country developed and developing. So, yeah. That's great. Yeah. I'm, I'm, certainly your, I mean, your website, um, I will, it's, it's, it's there actually, uh, just, just beside you, mindday.ca, but I will also, when I share this video, I'll make sure to post it and, and uh, hopefully people will come to your website and learn more about what they can do uh, to help people with mental illness in developing countries. Uh, just one more, one more note on that. Yeah. The, when people, uh, Scott Harrison of CharityWater.org, he's been a real role model for me. He helps people get clean water in developing countries, and he's really making waves in the social entrepreneur world. He's a lot of people really look to him. He's uh, going way beyond what most nonprofits have done for years, and he's encouraging people to, for his nonprofit, to donate monthly. And for anybody listening to this who want to donate to any of the six nonprofits I'm steering people towards or any nonprofit for any cause, uh, consider donating monthly because it's easier on your pocketbook because there's smaller monthly donations. The, the, non, the nonprofits like it because it's easier on their, it's easier for them to balance their budgets for the year. Yeah. And they're also following the lead of uh, like Spotify and uh, Netflix who have all these big large companies have learned that monthly subscriptions are the best way to go uh, for for bus business wise so i it's uh, and plus the six nonprofits that i steer people towards they allow uh, as little as like three dollars a month for three dollars a month you can help somebody get some mental health care three dollars a month some are like their minimum might be five maybe ten dollars a month but some are like just three dollars a month which That's is incredible just, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and 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 look, the the reality is, I'm sure anybody listening uh, or watching this can fully acknowledge that they can afford a small donation. But it, like any donation to the to the developing countries, um, a small amount can go a very long way. It can actually make a real difference. So, yeah. I think that, that that's an important part of the this message. Um, because we're talking about our illnesses, we'll start with you, and then I'll talk about bipolar. Um, because some of the people that, that are watching may be experiencing those illnesses. They may not be in as good a place as we are in. Um, so do you have any resources for people going through schizophrenia here at home? Yeah, I've, uh, Lauren, Lauren Kennedy, she's got a YouTube channel called Living Well with Schizophrenia. And I think she's in Calgary or at least Alberta, Canada, somewhere, I think Calgary. And she's, I'm really impressed with her YouTube channel. She gives a lot of great resources on, on what it's like, on how to get through schizophrenia. It's, I'm really impressed with her. And another great resource is Students with Psychosis. It used to be called Students with Schizophrenia. And I believe the website is SWS. They've, uh, they've kept the Students with Schizophrenia domain name. And the, the leader of that, Cecilia, and I, I don't know how you say your last name, it's MC G-O-U-G-H, Mago, McGough, I'm not sure how she pronounces that. Mm -hmm. But she, She's got student advocates all over the world. And that if you're a student going through psychosis or schizophrenia, please uh, look up her, uh, her website and her platform. She, I mean, she's got a TED talk called uh, Schizophrenia, I'm Not a Monster. I mean, that's what we've, I mean, I've had to live with that. I mean, I've other, I mean, she's got the TED talk with monster right in the title. And that TED yeah. talk came out in 2014, 2015. And it's, it's, those are the, that's a stigma that I've had to it deal is. with. Yeah. You know, it is, is Matthew violent? It's, and by the way, the stats on that for schizophrenia, people with schizophrenia are no more prone to violence than the rest of the general population. That's, that is also true for across all mental illnesses. In fact, the, uh, 
the, the, the stat that I like to really reassure people with when they wonder, you know, are people with mental illness violent or prone to violence? It's that people with mental illness are far more likely to be the victims of violence than the perpetrators of violence. Yeah. And that, that has actually um, proven true across multiple countries. And so it is a very important reminder that the person with the illness, is, it's only in extremes, just like the extremes of a person that does not have a mental illness may be violent. It's only in the extremes that they are. The, in the main, it, it is absolutely, they're more likely to be, um, to be ostracized or to be hurt in some other way as a result of their mental illness and the stigma that surrounds it. Uh, so yeah, I really agree with you on that. And uh, the, what I would say for people out there who are interested to learn more about um, uh, bipolar disorder, uh, there's a few resources that, that uh, we at Stigma Zero are proud to offer for free. Um, if you email hello at stigmazero.com and simply say you would like the free resources, uh, one of those includes an online um, a, a version of our online program that we released as a result of COVID, because when COVID came out, as everybody is recognizing, it was a massive strain on the mental health of our society. People who previously had never experienced symptoms were suddenly experiencing anxiety or depression as a result of all the changes that we've had in our life. And so this, uh, this online program that we created for free is called Mental Health 101. And it goes into just understanding what your mental health is, what are the signs of a potential mental illness, and what you can do for yourself or for others if you're in that position. Uh, also feel free to visit stigmazero.com. Um, there's lots of information and external links on there as well. And um, uh, I just, I, I want to highlight two things that are common between you and I that I believe are massively important to our success. And it's simply that we never quit. We never gave up. We always believed that it was possible that tomorrow would be better. And I, I think that it's, it's, it's kind of a, a funny mix of dogged determination towards a goal. In this case, that goal is living well, but also a real optimism, an actual innate optimism, this belief that things can get better. And that doesn't mean that those two things alone will do it. But those two attributes that we both shared led us ultimately to researching what could we be doing differently. You read books because it was earlier than me. For me, uh, my situation happened, uh, my illness presented itself uh, when I was 26 years old. So it was in 2000, um, 2001 and between 2001 and 2005. And in that time frame, I was able to go online and learn what is bipolar disorder and what do I need to do and, and all of those things. But the largest difference between people facing a physical illness like cancer or a mental illness like what we have faced is that the person with the physical illness has a clearer idea of what they need to do and whose advice they need to take. Whereas for you and I, often there was a whole lot of question marks around that. What exactly should I be doing or shouldn't I be doing? And if you, if you can bring clarity to that, you can increase the chances of recovery dramatically. Go ahead, you wanted to say something. Oh, well, the, yeah, I saw your, uh, your talk, your talk, you talk about the, your, your uh, bout with cancer and I, just like what you said, where everything was clear cut, uh, there's no stigma around it. And then when you got mental illness, it's like all the stigma and plus the how to get better wasn't, wasn't, it wasn't clear cut. And yeah, when I went through it, I mean, in 94, when I was first, uh, when they dropped the bombshell of you've got schizophrenia, I'm like, wow, yeah. there wasn't much literature. And even today, there's not like, if, if you go into the bookstore, there's very few books on schizophrenia, at least where I am, tons of books on depression and anxiety, mm -hmm. someone bipolar and, and, and even OCD, schizophrenia, uh, there's not tons written on it. And that's why I just need to be vocal about this and get more people talking about this. Yeah. And yeah, so. I think, um, I think that it's, it's, it's such a challenging thing because I never want to suggest that every person who experiences a mental illness 
will recover, can recover, because obviously there are people who face every illness who are unable to overcome it ultimately. But what I do know is that un unless you try and give every ounce of who you are, give, you know, and not just, not just try hard, but try hard in a smart way. And really, I, I use a phrase called, you have to own your illness. So you, you overheard, uh, or you had to receive this diagnosis of schizophrenia, which is, I can't even imagine how terrifying that would have been. It was very, very difficult when I received my diagnosis of bipolar. But in either case, if you don't accept that diagnosis and own it and recognize it for what it is, you'll never be able to be uh, an advocate for yourself because you'll be stuck in, in either denial or anger or, or just despair. And so I, I absolutely think that um, uh, the mindset has to be towards what can I do, small and large, to improve this. I apologize for the uh, <laughs> The problem is if I mute it, I, we won't have sound in this interview. So forgive me for that. But no um, look, what, uh, um, what I would like to do as we, as we wrap this up, uh, you know, to, to find you online, I want to reiterate mindaid.ca is, is the main way. Uh, are you, can you be found anywhere else online? Yeah, I'm on Facebook, TikTok, YouTube, and LinkedIn. The YouTube channel, I've got over 200 videos there of, of other people's videos on YouTube for, uh, about the cause. I've got about 80 or so of my own videos that I've made. And TikTok, I got on that uh, in the wintertime, and I'm started uh, sort of trying to figure that out. I've got some, a yeah. fair number of videos there too. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. That, that um, makes, yeah. So we're gonna, to make it easy for any people watching this, um, when this is posted, all of these links will be in the post. So you, it, you'll be able to just click on them and follow them. And, uh, and I'll make sure I get those from you, Matt, um, before, yeah. we, uh, before we post this. And, and look, I just, I wanna come back to, to saying again, Congratulations on just the the sheer willpower that it took for you to stick with it, and also you have um, you have a fairly unique perspective. I've been doing this work for for a long time since two thousand five, and I have met several people with schizophrenia. I've met many people with bipolar, and then countless people with anxiety and depression. And you're among the very few who I can say has a broad perspective on this. It's not something that you view as something that just happened to you. It's something that you recognize is happening to others and your desire to help others both here and in developing countries is something to be admired and applauded. Um, I know what motivates me is the same thing that motivates you. We were given in some respects a pretty pretty broad deal in that we, we were given diagnoses of, of major mental illnesses. I mean, nobody wants that, but we also know how lucky we are to have come out the other side and be well and living well and living in Canada and living in a country with uh, an incredible social network, even if it's not perfect for mental illness. Um, there's a sense of gratitude for that. And there's a sense of frankly, responsibility we have knowledge that we can share in helping others. And uh, I know that's what motivates you. Oh yeah, yeah, it's, I, I can't keep this in and, and not share like all the knowledge I have from all the books I've read, uh, like all the mindset things. I mean, I've read books by Navy SEALs, uh, people who've studied, people who've gone through the Holocaust and horrible things. And the I mean, soldier, and soldiers, they say, you know, your mind is your biggest, the most important thing for survival not your it's more so than your physical it's your mind yes. and and if people just if i could leave one message for people listen to this if you're if you're going through mental illness and you're thinking i don't know how i can do this i don't know if i can do this i was the same way for so many years from severe to mild over 27 years every day was i don't know if i can do this i don't know if i can tie my shoes i don't know if i can hold this spoon i don't know if i can but what I want to tell you is you are capable of so much more than you think. The, it's, the, the, there, there, there's so much, 
there's vast, vast, vast amounts of courage, determination, patience buried deep inside you. And when mental illness comes along, it forces you to delve deep into those. Everyone has those. For people who are listening who don't have mental illness, you have those inside of you waiting to be used at a moment's notice. For, any, for, for mental illness or anything horrible that you have to go through. It's in everybody just yeah. waiting to be used. So don't give up. Please don't give up. It's uh, life. It's, it's worth it. Yeah, such an important message. And, and um, one of the things I believe that the work that we're doing and the work that anyone in the mental health space, uh, anyone who is trying to eliminate the stigma, to add to the knowledge base, to add to the resource base, one of the most important uh, impacts that we can have is reducing the number of people who die by suicide because they are in despair. And I always say in my keynotes, if you, just like you said, if you are feeling lost, if you are feeling overwhelmed by all of this, there are two truths and they will not change. You have value and it is possible for this to get better. So you're not alone. And if you simply reach out and talk to people in your life, let them know you need help. People more and more and more every day, people are willing and more capable to give that help because this, this conversation is happening so much more that people are becoming more comfortable with it. And that's a wonderful side effect of the kind of ad advocacy work that you do and that I've done. And that is a key message uh, for anyone out there. So I, again, I'm going to um, encourage you to look at the links that are um, in the posts where you saw this video, follow those, feel free to uh, contact Matt directly uh, through his MindAid website. Feel free to contact me through hello at stigmazero.com and do everything you can to own your illness if you have one. And if you're watching this and you've never experienced any kind of mental health challenge, but someone in your life is right now, remember that your role as a caregiver could be life-saving. You have to open yourself up to that person, encourage them to talk to you, encourage them and trust that they, give them the, the freedom of, of trust that you won't have stigma towards them. That is so important. Uh, Matt, before we go, any closing words? Oh, the, I, I, I call it hope beyond hope. When you think there's just no hope left, you think I, I, I just can't do this anymore. There's something else that just carries you through when you can't carry yourself. And I call it, when, when I call it hope beyond hope. It's there. You look back on it a day later, a week later, a month later, and you think, I didn't know how I was going to get through that. Yet things, things worked out. They, they, things as bad as they were, they still kind of worked out. And I kept going. I kept going. Yeah. And 27 a, years you did that. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's absolutely astonishing, honestly. And, uh, and, and, Frankly, I didn't say it earlier, but uh, as, as part of my illness, as part of bipolar, I also, um, like Matt, had, I had my own time in a psychiatric institution as a result of a manic episode. And I think you will agree with me when I say this, that that is a bleak moment. When you wake up in the morning and you're in a psychiatric hospital and you have to acknowledge the fact that you should be there. In that moment in time, you need to be there. That is difficult. That is a humbling, hard moment. But once you acknowledge it and once you own it, the only question is, is, well, what do I have to do to get out of here? What do I have to do to get better so that I can take care of myself? And then once you can take care of yourself, then that's when things like this happen. And, and people like Matt and I do this sort of work because we found a way to take care of ourselves. And now we're trying to help others do the same thing. So thank you very much for anyone and everyone who has tuned into this and has taken the time to listen. I highly encourage you go to mindaid.ca and check out all that Matt Dixon has done to pull together vital information about how developing countries, uh, they need our help when it comes to men mental health and, and also what we can do uh, in a real tangible way starting right now. Thank you very much, Matt. I really have appreciated this conversation. Yeah, thanks, Jason. Thanks for having me on. It's been great.